and welcome to I24 News Sports Daily Magazine with all the latest scores and stories from the world of sports and we have plenty of action coming your way. The women's final in the Australian Open is now set. It will be number one against number two. The list of candidates for the FIFA presidency closes today and there is a new and interesting name on the list. And the former ping pong diplomacy is now becoming the triathlon diplomacy as American triathletes compete in Cuba. All this and much more coming up. Let's get started. We begin in Spain where Barcelona traveled to Madrid to face Atletico in the second leg of the quarterfinal in the Spanish Cup with a very fragile 1-0 advantage from the first match. It took just 45 seconds for this advantage to be gone. Fernando Torres did the same as he did in the previous round against Real Madrid and scored as soon as the game started. But Barcelona quickly reacted. Eight minutes went by and the clever setup by Luis Suarez puts Neymar in a position he will not miss from. 1-0 and now Atletico needs two goals. They got one from a dubious penalty on the half-hour mark. Raul Garcia scores from the spot. One more goal would now put the Cochoneros through. One of their players did score, but to the wrong net. The game is once again tied, and just before halftime, Neymar does it again. Barcelona win 3-2 here and 4-2 in aggregate to book their semi-final spot. Barcelona will face the winner of the tie between Getafe and Villarreal. Getafe will host the second leg tonight after losing the first leg 1-0. The second semi-final will also be decided tonight as Athletic Bilbao hosts Malaga after a goalless draw in the first leg and Espanyol travels to Seville with a 3-1 advantage from the first match. Today is the last day to present candidacies for the FIFA presidential elections which will be held in exactly four months. The latest man to announce he is running for the post may face a real challenge to current president Seb Blatter. Former Portugal international Luis Figo said he, 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 jo he joined the nomination needed for the official campaigning. While announcing his bid, Figo said that football has given him so much during his life and he wants to give something back to the game. He also added that football fans around the world deserve an organization with a better reputation than that of FIFA. Figo joins four other candidates, French Jérôme Champagne, Prince Ali bin al Hussein from Jordan, the head of the Dutch Football Federation Michael van Praag, and former French player David Ginola. All of them will try to move Blatter out of his seat in the May 29th elections. Tennis now in the women's final is set at the Australian Open, it will, and it will be a classic one. The number one will face the number two. World number one Serena Williams faced fellow American Madison Keys, who beat sis Serena's sister Venus in the quarterfinal. And she gave the younger sister a very hard time in the first set. Serena needed 45 minutes to win it on a tiebreak. Things got much easier after that. The five time champion is now just one win away from number six, after winning the semi final in straight sets 7 6 and 6 2. Her opponent in the final will be world number two, Maria Sharapova. She had quite an easy run in the semi, beating fellow Russian Ekaterina Makarova in straight sets 6-3 and 6-2. Sharapova survived a big scare in the second round, saving two match points against Alexandra Panova, but had been very impressive since. She won the Australian Open once in 2008 for well, number two. Come seven years later, the answer on Saturday morning. Now to the men's tournament, where we already have one finalist. World number six, Andy Murray is the one, as he beat Czech Tomasz Verdich in four sets. The Scot lost the first set in a tiebreak, but came back to take the next three and book his place in the Australian Open final for the fourth time. Murray lost all four of them, and he would love to go one step higher this time. Tomorrow morning, he will find out who will be his rival in the final. Last year's champion, Stanislas Wawrinka, or world number one, Novak Djokovic. Two names are missing from the list of semi-finalists in Australia. Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal did not make it to the Final Four in Melbourne this year. Believe it or not, the last time that happened was 12 years ago. Ever since 2003, at least one of them made it to the semi-finals. Is it just bad luck or something deeper than that? Lise Barenboom and Benjamin Chongalvaris try to answer. Are we witnessing the end of an era? There will be no Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal in the semis of the Australian Open for the first time since 2003. It's not the first time this happened at a Grand Slam. 2013, it was already the case in Wimbledon. The page has turned and Roger Federer seems to have accepted it after his third round defeat against Andrea Seppi. 
Despite 57 winners, the Swiss committed 55 unforced errors, an amazing statistic for the world number two. Just a bad day, yeah. Um, I mean, I wish I could have played better, but uh, clearly it was, uh, it was tough losing the first two, you know. Um, had chances to get back into it and let it slip. A rare defeat for the Swissman, who earned 17 titles in majors in his career. Since 2001, he's always been part of the second week in Melbourne. Roger Federer remained on a series of 11 consecutive semifinals at the Australian Open. Of the 11 Australian semis, Federer has advanced the finals five times and won the championship four times. But he had lost the last four between 2011 and 2014. For Nadal, the Australian land seems pretty inhospitable. After a final defeat against Wawrinka because of a back injury last year, a knee surgery in 2013, and another defeat in the final against Djokovic in 2012, Nadal has not truly managed to stand out in this tournament. It was only in 2009 where he won against Federer. This year his season started off poorly. The Spaniard came back from injury and was knocked out in the first round of the tournament in Doha. Another bad performance continued with a lightning defeat to Berdych in the quarterfinals in Melbourne. When you are coming back from an injury, you lose more easier the feeling than than what you what what than than what you do when when you are on rhythm, when you are with no injuries, when you are confident on on yourself. And Nadal is under no illusions about his level in that game. You've been very up and down. You've had a very good match, very so-so match in this. No, very so-so, no very bad. <laughs> <laughs> You can say, no problem. <laughs> Nothing says the infernal duo will not be back to its best at the French Open, Wimbledon and the US Open. Until then, the road is open for possibly a new big winner. The contenders are waiting for you, Nishikori, Berdic, Raonic, and even the young Nick Kyrgios, all thanks to the poor results by Nadal and Federer. Running a marathon is extremely hard. Running seven marathons in a week sounds crazy, but if you do it in seven different continents, meaning the only time you can rest and eat is on flights, you must be insane. Twelve competitors, which apparently are insane, did just that as they completed the World Marathon Challenge. At the finish line in Sydney, they were happy and extremely exhausted. Malka Friedman brings their stories. The first ever World Marathon Challenge finished in Sydney, Australia after a grueling series of seven marathons in seven days across seven continents. Here we go, number two. This has been categorized as one of the toughest foot races in the world. A first for everyone competing and the participants had no idea what to expect. None of us have done anything like this because it's never really been done before. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it works. At the moment, everyone's happy, uh, but I'm sure there's going to be times when that isn't the case. Of the 12 competitors, 11 were men, and there was one woman who completed the 183 miles on foot, traveling approximately 24,000 miles in total over the week. The athletes ran in snow and then through high temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius, sleeping and eating on the flights between the locations. So you've got temperature fluctuations, flying, um, you know, not ideal. In, you probably won't be eating, sitting down eating meals on the way, you know, a lot of airline food probably en route. Um, and you know, that combination of issues is what they're really facing. At each location, local running experts ensure that all the marathons ran on the custom-made courses with the precise distances. The participants had very little time to rest as they would run and then hop onto the plane to their next destination. After running in Antarctica, Chile, the U.S. and Spain, the athletes then ran in Marrakesh during the night under the pouring rain and it was inevitable for some of the runners to feel the fatigue as this wild endeavor took a toll on them. The next stop was Dubai where they got to meet the two-time Olympic gold medalist and five-time world champion Haile Gabriselasse. One of the most recognizable figures in athletics, he said he was pleased to see the runners take part in this race. I am here in Dubai. I would like to say good luck to everybody for the world marathon, running on the seven continent and the seven marathon. Keep it up. The 183 total miles and over 59 hours in the air has made this one of the most epic races of all time, leaving the winner of the race truly happy with this accomplishment. It's been a great adventure, and that's what it's been. It's not a race, it's been an adventure for all of us. There are big smiles for all the participants as they finish the race, a victory that they'll remember forever.
crazy indeed. Now to the NBA and to the Texas duel in Houston where the Rockets face the Dallas Mavericks. The home team had to deal without injured Dwight Howard and they got a solid offensive team performance with no less than six players scoring in double digits. It was close all along. The Rockets came into the final seconds with a three-point gap. Dallas then had a chance to tie it or even take the lead after a flagrant foul on Tyson Chandler, but he missed four free throws. The Mavs did nothing with the possession they still had and James Harden scored two free throws on the other side to give the Rockets a 99-94 win. Still with American sports and in the early 70s, the ping pong diplomacy broke the ice between the United States and China, paving the way for the visit of American President Richard Nixon to the giant Asian state. Now we can refer to the triathlon diplomacy. For the first time, American triathletes took part in the Havana Triathlon, a sign of the improved relations between the United States and Cuba. Michael Friedman with this optimistic story. The United States and Cuba have had a long and distant history, but the new and improved relations between the two countries has provided great opportunities through sport. Athletics have once again showed us how it can bring people together. American athletes entered Cuba to swim, bike, and run in a triathlon in Havana for the first time. 25 triathletes from the United States secured special licenses from their government, which allowed them to participate in the race. The 372 triathletes from 29 countries enjoy the beauty that the small country has to offer along Havana's seafront. But of all the countries present, America was by far the biggest story. We are going through a special moment with the normalization of relations between Cuba and the United States, and sports are also a way to bring people together. This was Team USA Triathlon's first trip to the island nation that has been off limits for most Americans for over 50 years. And many of those athletes believe others from the United States will like to come to Cuba in the future. I think a lot of Americans want to come here. And I know the Cubans are interested in having this as well. So we're looking forward to opening up the, the door. I think the, the floodgates are open now. I don't think it's a, a non-stop thing. This event has also raised hope among Cubans who wish to see more U.S. tourists in the future. As sports create new opportunities around the island, it can also provide great financial growth and give the country more recognition. I wish more Americans would be able to come in solidarity. And apart from that, high-level athletes would also bring prestige to any competition taking place here. As the sun set, the Ironman winner from Argentina crossed the finish line with great joy. Athletics have once again proved to be a pivotal tool in uniting people from around the world. Super Bowl 49 will be held this coming Sunday, and of course it gets the biggest headlines in American media. But there is also another former American hero who is getting a lot of attention. Here's Michael Friedman with this week's press review. We begin this week's press review with Yahoo Sports headlines which read, Lance Armstrong, I would dope again. The former champion spoke out in a BBC interview and said, if you take me back to 1995 when it was completely and totally pervasive, I'd probably do it again. While this might come to a surprise to many, it is probably the most honest thing he said since the doping scandal began. The man who was stripped of his seven Tour de France titles and banned for life from competition also said that his life has been brutal since he told Oprah Winfrey that he cheated. The controversial figure continues to find ways in the news. And next, we go to the NFL as we are getting ready for the Super Bowl this weekend with full media coverage. But the big anticipation are always the infamous commercials people tune in to watch. GoDaddy already had to pull one of their Super Bowl ads over the social media uproar. As advertisers pour tons of money into campaigns, they are known to have a field day with humor, half nudity, and spoofs. Do you foresee more commercials like this on Sunday? All natural, juicy. Grass-fed beef. Introducing the All Natural Burger, the first ever in fast food. With no antibiotics, no added hormones, and no steroids. Only at Carl's Jr. But before the Super Bowl takes place, we go to witness the 11th Puppy Bowl in New York. The 85 cute puppies participate as a way to promote adoption for animals in shelters. Take a look at the Puppy Bowl. It's been 12 months since the cutest sports arena on the planet has seen action. But that's about to change. Today is Puppy Bowl Sunday. And this is Puppy Bowl 11. 
Welcome, everyone. I'm Scott Graham. It's my pleasure to bring you the play-by-play. -play. Kickoff is only moments away. First time, two puppy teams, Team Fluff in yellow and Team Rough in green, compete to become the cutest puppy team in the world. Those are some adorable doggy linebackers. And that's all for this week's press review. Puppy Bowl, some things can happen only in America. And that's it for us today. Don't forget you can watch us anytime on our website at i24news.tv. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you for watching and have a beautiful day.